Welcome, Mindsetters. We are here. It is prelim exam revision. You're here with me, your girl Megs, and of course, my lovely, fantastic life science teacher, Mr. Aslam. How have you been? Hi, Meg. How are <sighs> you doing? I haven't seen you in such a long time. It's you actually long, have no too idea. Long, too long. But today, are you excited? I'm always excited. Are you feeling excited. warmed up? Always. You ready to run that marathon? Definitely. <laughs> Lots of marathons. <laughs> Well, guys, I'm here to tell you what today's about, what's coming on today. And, of course, you know, today is prelim exam revision. And don't go anywhere. You know why? Why, Megan? Because right after this, it's maths, literacy, accounting, and, of course, geography. I stress to you, it's going to be good, good, good revision for you. And, of course, it benefits yourself. So, other things I'm here to tell you about is, of course... You've heard about it the whole week. It's on Facebook. It is that Samsung have partnered with Mindset and, of course, they have brought and introduced the Learning Hub. So I'm sure you're asking me if this is the first time you hear about it. What is it? So basically, if I click open here, you see that you can buy a lot of screen content. Um, there's video revision. You download the exam revision content. And voila, all this revision at your disposal. So if you want to know what that's about, it's only for sorry, Samsung tablets and also premium smartphones. Another thing I want to tell you about today, it's very exciting. Today is the day that we are introducing the Learn Extra Revision Marathon Competition partnered with Sony to get fantastic Sony prizes. You could stand a chance to win one of these great tablets. Could you believe that? You entering a tablet? I know, right? Crazy. But the way you do it is, starting from next week, Monday, you check, you look on the notes, guys, on the downloadable notes, which is mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra. You'll see on the bottom, there'll be a race number. So look out for that because you actually need those race numbers and we'll tell you all about the details with that competition. So for now, I'm going to stop talking because we have a lot of prelim exam revision to go through, but I'm here with you. Let's do this. Let's rock it with Mr. Aslam. Thanks, Megan. Welcome, Mindsetters. We are ready to rock and roll. I'm hoping you are getting to the nitty-gritty of revising. You've written your prelims, you've seen your papers, you've probably gone through them, you have saw what you've done wrong. It is now time to put what is wrong right. It is time to put those questions. Which question bonked you out in the prelims? Send them to Megan. Megan will send it to me, and we can answer that for you as well. We will try. Or at least the community of learners on the Facebook page will also help you. So post those questions, guys. The time is now. Now, now, now. Not tomorrow. Today. What are we doing in what we are doing? We are looking at mainly the last few prep exams from some of the provinces that we have, and we go back in time to some of the version two papers, which are the of which the content is still relevant for you as well in version one. Remember, this year there's only one paper. There's no version one and version two, so you must be prepared for that particular paper. So that's what we're doing today, and let's get straight into it. This one is adapted from. November 2012, we've done 2012 before, but we haven't done version 2. We have concentrated on version 1. Now we are looking at version 2 because the content is the same. It says the graph below shows the results of an experiment done to investigate the average time that fruit flies. Now watch the, the key words now. Here's your aim of this investigation investigate the average time that fruit flies can survive without food. In other words, starvation resistance. How long can they go without food? The average starvation resistance time is when 80% of the population has died out. The researcher placed 5,000 fruit fly offspring from the same generation in a large container without food. The average starvation resistance time was recorded. The eggs from the container were collected. That means there were some eggs transferred to a new container and allowed to hatch. This is now the second generation. The average starvation resistance time was recorded again. The procedure was repeated until the eighth generation. So we went on eight times with this. 
First of all, you say, identify the dependent variable in the investigation. How do we get to this point when we don't have any tables in front of us, we don't have any graphs in front of us, how do we do that? We go back to the start of this little paragraph, and I underline that first part that told us what is the aim of this investigation. The experiment was done to, why was it done? To investigate the average time, the average time, fruit flies can survive without food, right? So the survival of fruit flies, when? In terms of starvation without food. So those are our two variables. So we want to know the independent variable here, and that would be the starvation, uh, the, sorry, the dependent variable, the starvation resistance time. That means how long can they survive? Now, why is that the dependent variable? That is the dependent variable because you and I, the investigator or this researcher, had no control over that. He has control on the different generations and he's got uh, uh, of the type of fruit flies he used. He can change that, he can change a whole lot of other things, but he cannot change this part here. So this part is dependent on what he changes. Therefore, it's a dependent uh, uh, variable. State two factors that should have been kept constant during this investigation. In other words, now again, a little history about investigations. So don't look at this in terms of the fruit flies. Don't look at this in terms of whatever topic it's dealing with. But look at it in terms of a question that deals with investigations, guys. When we're dealing with invest in investigation questions, we need to know certain things, dependent variable, uh, independent variable, the controlled variables, etc. Now, apart from that, whenever we want to investigate anything, if we want to in investigate, for example, what causes uh, enzymes to denature, we need to look at those variables that can affect this investigation and we need to keep those other variables constant. Let's say, for example, we say that it's temperature that denatures enzyme. The only thing that must change in all our scenarios is temperature, because that is what we are investigating. All other factors, light, a pH, uh, amount of substrate, all those things must be the same in each instance, because we want to see if we change temperature, what happens. So this is what we mean in this question here. What other factors must be kept constant? And again here, first of all, the temperature in the containers must be the same because we're not investigating temperature. We're investigating starvation. The flies from the same generation, which they already told us about. The flies of the same species. You can't use flies from different species. It's not going to help. We must have the same amount of food that was given initially the number of eggs used from time to time in the next few generations, and the results are, are up to that point there is where we stop. So these are some of the things that you needed to keep constant. You may even argue further, the person who counts must also be kept constant, because if we use two different people, one may be a bit lazy, one may be a little bit more specific and more on the ball, more meticulous. So even that must be kept constant because you can get different readings from different people as well. The size of the container must be the same, because the space can restrict it as well. Good. Now they're saying the results of the first eight generations in the investigation were as follows. They're giving you the data in the form of a bar graph. Again, always when we use this, we use this to show how to draw bar graph at the same time. Notice the heading is given, and this heading has both uh, variables, average starvation resistance over eight generations. That means over time. And on this side, the, as your, in your dependent variable, as you mentioned earlier, the average starvation resistance time in hours. And here we have the different generations from generation one to two, three, four, five, six, eight. Notice the units are not given in the heading. The units are given with the axis headings, the y-axis and the 
x-axis. Now here, because it's number of generations, number is a unit on its own, we don't have to write there in, in brackets number. If it was time, if it was age, etc., then we would have to put a unit there as well. Notice also when we draw bars, the bars themselves must have the same width across that bar graph. Must also that the distance between one, two, three, four must be equidistant apart. And your units on this side, needless to say, whether it's a line graph or a bar graph, all units, in this case there's no units because there's different generations, but the units must also be equidistant apart. If we take a reading from here, from zero to five, it's five, from 35 to 40, it's still five. Those things must be kept constant, remember that. So they've given us this. Here it's 20. Let's take that out, not nice color there. That's 20, that's about 27 and a half, more or less, uh, 22 and a half, sorry. That would be 25, uh, that would be 27 and a half. That would be about 32 plus minus. That will be about 32 and a half, more or less, 35 given there. And if we go a little up, then we would see that this is about 37 and a half. That's what we're getting as we're going along there. In terms of natural selection, now look at the question. In terms of natural selection, why? Explain why the average starvation resistance time of the fruit flies is different in each generation. We can see that as we are moving from here to there, there's something happening with the average resistance time. It's increasing. They want to know why is this so. Now notice the question is, is directing you to natural selection. So our answer must be in relation to that. First of all, every time we have explained natural selection on set, and anywhere else in your books, in your exams, you start by saying that there's genetic variety in the fruit flies. Original population had some variety. Some fruit flies had longer starvation resistance time and others. So one is you giving the generic. What is the generic? There's variety. Now you go to the context. And in this case, what is the context? The difference, that the variety that we are talking about speaks to the starvation resistance time. So you need to be making reference to that as well. Okay? Then you move on and you start talking about when there was no food. The fruit flies with shorter starvation resistance did not die, uh, did not survive, sorry, did not survive. And if they did not survive, that means they would, their population would decrease. At the same time, the fruit flies with longer starvation resistance time survived. And if they survived, they could reproduce. And when they reproduced, they formed, they passed that favorable characteristic in the form of a gene. Why? Because they had the gene for longer resistance. It didn't happen in their lifetime. They had this gene. What we said in the start, some had it and some didn't. They had this gene for starving for longer. So they passed it to their offspring. And with that, now, the genes or, or the genotype for the fable trait were passed on to subsequent generations. And as time goes on, over several generations, it doesn't happen today and tomorrow, over several generations, you can say that the gene frequency, frequency for longer resistance increased. And obviously vice versa, the one for shorter resistance decreased over time. So can you see, guys, that the answer to this is no different from any example of natural selection. Your, 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 your plan is still the same. You start off by talking about variety, competition, and then you talk about favorable characteristics, natural selection taking place, those that are better will survive, those that are not better will die, and over several generations, those that survive will reproduce, and their frequency will increase over time. Are we clear with that one there? Good. We move on.
The diagrams below show the progression of human evolution. Study the diagrams of some of the early hominids, and we're going to answer the questions. But before we do that, I think I've given you quite a bit, yeah. so we can take Are a Are you ready break. for a break? Yeah. Okay, guys, don't go anywhere. Okay, maybe just go somewhere. Get a glass of water, go to the bathroom, do whatever you need, jump up and down, because when we come back, we'll be back with Life Sciences. Welcome back, guys. I hope you had a good break. Stretched out your muscles, got a little bit loose because, you know, we are running a marathon here at Mindset because, you know what, it's prelim revision. You're almost at the finish line, but we have to keep a steady pace. Don't forget. Don't forget about the competition that Samsung have here at the Mindset Studios. You could be a lucky Mindsetter and win yourself a Samsung tablet that they will be handing out. So fantastic Samsung prizes. Don't forget, it's called the Learn Extra Samsung, oh, Learn Extra Revision Marathon is it competition? Yes, okay. So don't forget about that because next week you have to check the notes that you download and at the bottom they will have a race number. So please don't forget any of that. And with that, I have a question from Riffle Tia. He says, Mr. Aslam, what's the key points to put when explaining the weak and strongest of organisms, so in brackets, natural selection, using Charles Darwin's explanation? Good. What's the name there? Uh, Riffle Tia, if Riffle I said it right. Tia. Yeah. Right. Okay, or guys. Tia. Yeah. Very simple. What we've just discussed now was natural se selection, right? Now, what are the key points when we're dealing with natural selection? We start with talking about variety. Remember, I'm just giving you words. You need to fill these words with sentences, or rather, use these words in a sentence, and you've got to put the context. For example, when we're talking about the fruit flies, we're going to say that there is variety in the original population, one. And then we're going to give the context. What was the context? Some had longer sh survival rates in terms of starvation and others shorter, okay? So that's what we would say there first. Then we would say there will be competition. These fruit flies are in one container. So obviously, they're going to compete for whatever is available, space, mates, etc. in that time, okay? So that's the next point that we can talk about. Then we're going to talk about suitability. And this is the stem of his question. Oh, it is a boy, yes? Yes. OK. Right. <laughs> it is his question there, and that is about suitability. Now, what are we talking about suitability? We said here that they have different characteristics. Now we're going to say of these two characteristics, these contrasting characteristics, one has long surviving, one has short surviving, which one is a better suitability. So we would then agree that the one that can survive longer without food will be more suited. All right? Or let's change, change, change the example. Let's say we had, let's go to the famous Manchester moths when the pollution was high. Uh, the moths that, what was the variety there? Again, variety. There was competition for space, mates, etc. What was the variety? Oh, some were darker shaded and some were lighter shaded. When the pollution was high, the ones with darker shade were more suitable to the environment. That's what we are talking about here. Which characteristic is more suitable at that time in that place? Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Then we're going to say, obviously, the one with the more suitable characteristics will survive. And this is known as survival of the fittest or natural selection. Same thing. And this is a common uh, c concept, survival of the fittest. We know that. When you go for trials for soccer, they don't take everybody. The ones that are the best, they're going to take netball, volleyball, whatever. So that's what we mean by survival. Of that coach says, I want this type of team. So he's going to select those players that fit into his game plan. And you'll have survival of the fittest. And thereafter, the gene the favorable ones will be passed on. And we can lastly talk about the frequency of the gene. One is going to go up and one is going to go down. The favorable one, there'll be more of. The less favorable one, there will be less of. While we're talking about important points, in terms of natural selection. So these are your points that you need to talk about natural selection. Let's 
quickly revise uh, the important facts or the important pattern one would have to take when explaining speciation. Speciation, believe it or not, also starts, first of all, let's just recap what speciation means. Speciation means the formation of new species from existing species. The formation of new species from existing species. And how does it follow? Again, there is variation or variation among the species. The original population will have variation. Then we must say that the original population was together. And because they were together, there was gene flow, and I'm going to use both words, gene flow, or we can say that the organisms could interbreed. So what am I saying by writing the slash? I mean that this could interbreed means that there is gene flow, or gene flow means that the organisms could interbreed. That's what we mean there, right? Then the populations get separated. Now this separation can be two types. One is because of a barrier, and the other is because of behavior or of niches. The organisms have different areas where they want to go to in the same area. Let's say this is a pond. Megan prefers to stay in that part of the pond, yeah. and Aslam prefers to stay in the deep here. Because of that, Megan, the population represented by Megan and the population represented by Aslam do not mix. There's nothing separating them. There's water. They can swim towards each other or whatever, but they have chosen to go there. This is what we mean by behavior or niches. A barrier means some mudslide took place, and now the pond has separated into two. Megan is in a separate pond. Aslam is in a different pond. That is when we say that it's a barrier. When a barrier is responsible for the separation, we call that allopatric speciation. And if it's behavior, we call it some Patrick. So if you are explaining allopatric, then up to that you're going to say this point here, you're going to say this point here, and then you're going to say that there's a barrier that separates them. If you are explaining some Patrick, you're going to still say this one, you're going to still say that one, and then you're going to say this point here. That's the difference in the explanation. Whatever follows after that is the same in both. What follows after that? That because they are separate, they will undergo natural selection independently. And obviously, independently, if they undergo natural selection independently, then what would that mean? That they will become genotypically and phenotypically different. And therefore, even if they come back together, even if they put together thereafter, there will be no gene flow or they cannot interbreed. Can you see that this term, we forgot it here. Oh, oh, we lost one mark already. We forgot to put that here, first of all. Because they were separated, they cannot interbreed. We must put that there. Now, that's why I got to this point. Notice, cannot interbreed comes twice. The first time they cannot interbreed is because of their separation, whichever way, whether it's barrier or niche. The, th the first time. The second time they cannot interbreed is because they have, now look at the reason, because they are now different species. And how we know this? They cannot interbreed. Why? Because of reproductive isolation. So you have to understand that this reproductive isolation affects both allopatric and sympatric. And what do we mean by reproductive isolation? Reproductive isolation. To isolate reproductively. What do that mean? That they can't interbreed. Why can't they interbreed? Because of different mating seasons different mating seasons, different courtship behavior, different sex organs that have become so different that they cannot fit into each other anymore. Or simply these organisms, when they see each other, they say, 
we're not of the same type. We don't look the same. So therefore, we do not mate with these ones. So there's a whole range of them. We can go into the very detailed pre-zygotic, post-zygotic, but it's not important for exams. This is what's important. You need to know what we mean by reproductive isolation. We simply mean they do not mate. Why? Because of some of these reasons here. Good? We move on then to question two. Now we're doing a little bit of human evolution. So we've done the first half, speciation and natural selection. Now we're moving towards human uh, evolution. Coming from Eastern Cape Prelim 2013, this year, paper one, question 3.1. The diagram below shows the progression of human evolution. Study the diagrams of some of the early hominids, A, B, C, D, E, which represent Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Australopithecus, Homo uh, habilis, and Homo neanderthalensis. <laughs> Can you say that? <laughs> no, right? no. Homo neanderthalensis. Read quite a lot of words here at Life Sciences. I learn, guys. Love. Some good words, eh? Yeah, you should, you should teach me. We can do grammar. <laughs> okay. Identify each of the above hominid members, A to E, correctly, according to that list that was given to you above. Okay? And there we go. A would be Australopithecus, then Homo habilis, then Homo erectus, then Homo neanderthalensis, and lastly, Homo sapiens. Okay? Mention any five common characteristics which are shared. Now, guys, this they can give you straightforward. Without these diagrams, they can just say, mention any five, six, seven, eight, three, two, whatever, characteristics that, which are shared by the members. That means, what they're actually asking is, what are the characters that we, homo sapiens, share with all the other primates? Okay? And your answer would be, again, starting on the top, they're freely uh, long upper limbs. Freely rotating, that's one, and long upper limbs. There's two there in that one there. Elbow joints allowing rotation of the forearm. Flat nails instead of claws, or we can say bare fingertips. Flexible wrists that are capable of rotating at, at least 180 degrees. Eyes that are in the front. The parts of the brain that deal with smell are reduced. The parts of the brain that, re, uh, that are associated with sight are enlarged. Opposable thumb, that gives us a power grip. Opposable thumb there. If you can look at the thumb and look at the fingers, the fingers are moving in one direction, the thumb moves in the other direction, so you're getting a power grip. A larger brain, all primates have a larger brain. You must watch this one because it's used in the differences and the similarities. Huh? Binocular vision and stereoscopic vision, please note that these are not the same thing. Binocular vision means that we can look at an object with two eyes, but we see the object as one. That's binocular vision. Stereoscopic vision explains to us that we can see the difference in depth. In other words, if I was standing uh, uh, higher up, if there was a, a platform here and I was standing, I would know that the floor is lower. So when I climb, I would be careful. I wouldn't just walk in space and fall down. Huh? Monkeys, for monkeys, that's important because they, they, for branchiation, what is that? They swing from one branch to the other. They need to know that if I'm coming from there, this branch is lower. Otherwise, smack into the tree. Thousand, you know the one. Okay? Uh, five fingers and, and bipedal. Name the family to which the above group. Notice the question. The family. Not the order. The family. Uh, and the family is hominidae, hominids. Okay? Supply any three characteristics that make the organism labeled E different from the other primates. How is E, E what you label as Homo sapiens, different? So can you see what we said? We looked at the similarities, now we're looking at the differences. Now it doesn't always come this way. Sometimes they give you the skulls or the skeleton of these different organisms, but your answer is going to be based on these similarities and these differences. However, when they give you diagrams and they say visible differences, then only what you can see. And when we're asking for the differences, we're looking for the progressive uh, differences in terms of the theory of evolution. You can't say there's a line here and there's no line there. That may be a printing error. We only have to look at the evolutionary uh, progression. And what are these differences? Homos are always bipedal. 
You notice we said they're bipedal, but homos are bipedal all the time, while the other primates can be quadrupedal as well. A flatter face, or remember the others are prognathous, a gently curved jawline, a gently curved jawline that goes like that, not like that. That's the other primates, more or less, U-shaped. Dental formula of 2123, which is different. A larger brain. Notice I said they, they said large brain. But humans have the larger brain of all of those. Largest, I should say. Larger brain. The use of artificial language to communicate. <laughs> and a more pronounced chin. And we can also say smaller canines. Those are the differences between humans and other primates. What's that? Megan. And we hit an air break. Mindsetters, don't go anywhere. Life Sciences will be back right after the break. And we're back, Mindsetters. I hope you had a good break, a good stretch, because we are here for Life Sciences Prelim Revision. And if you don't know or if you think your questions won't be answered, I promise you, if you go to learnextra.co.za forward slash help desk, well, I'm pretty sure that all our questions or all your questions will be answered. And they will because our help desk is there for you. But let me stress, don't go anywhere because after life sciences, we have math literacy, accounting, and geography. And if you don't do one of those subjects, stay tuned, take a break, and then we'll be back for other prelim revision in those three subjects. So don't go anywhere. Don't stress. And post your questions. Tell me how you're going. Tell me if there's questions. Download the notes. I promise you it is worth the effort. Mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra because all the notes are downloadable. And I see there's a lot of questions about where the race number is. Guys, that's from next week, Monday. You'll see a race number at the bottom. And that's to win prizes in our Samsung competition. Don't forget. So Mr. Aslam. There you go. Thanks, Megan. Guys, we have covered a little bit of evolution. Remember, the evolution was a continuation from what we did on Wednesday. Now we look at all the other sections in Paper 1. Remember, Paper 1, DNA, RNA, protein synthesis, genetics, meiosis, evolution. Those are the broad topics, and biotechnology is associated with DNA, RNA, protein synthesis, meiosis, and genetics. So those are the topics in paper one. Please, 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 look at the guide that you have in front of you uh, from your teacher, the textbook. If they have anything about reproduction in paper one, that's the wrong version. Huh? OK? And the version I'm talking about there is this letters here. No? Just now you get confused. I'm talking about that. That one there, no? Okay. The diagram below represents a metabolic process. They're not giving you a name. Uh, that takes place in a living cell. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. Coming from Eastern Cape Prelim 2013, paper 1, question 2.1. So they're telling you there, there's the organelle, organelle X. And further down is organelle Y, just to get the organelles out of the way. Then they tell you there's process 1 that is in this area, and there's process 2 that's in this area. Also in the diagram, you see amino acid P, amino acid P, Q, and amino acid R. And you have tRNA, tRNA, tRNA. Guys, that should have already told you what process is happening here. First of all, the fact that something is happening in one organelle and the next, there's only one process that you have learned that does that. And there's only one process that involves amino acids that you have learned. And there's only one process that involves transfer RNA as well. So that should be easy. Let's go to the questions. Name the process occurring in the diagram above. It would obviously be protein synthesis. Identify the following from the above diagram. Notice the examiners have been very specific. They say, they don't just say X, Y, 1, 2. They say organelle, 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 process, process. Okay? So they want to know in this diagram organelle X and Y. And from your studies, you should know. Watch what's happening here. 
something is happening, something is unwinding, and something else is happening there, and that thing is going out, and something is happening here. So organelle X has to be the nucleus. Organism Y has to be the ribosome. Process 1, what's happening there? Can we see that messenger RNA is making a copy there? That would be transcription. You cannot say protein synthesis now because they're asking you of, these, of this whole process, protein synthesis, what is process 1? You can't say protein synthesis there. And process 2 would be translation. Now, guys, these words, transcription and translation, are easy words. Transcription means to make a copy. That alone should explain the whole process, process one, where messenger RNA makes a copy of DNA. You're going to have to explain how that happens, obviously, to take it further. And then translation is where the amino acids are put together using the code that was given. That's why it's called translation. We had a code. Now we're using this code to make something from it. We are translating the code, and that's what's happening there. Okay, good. Let's go further. And obviously, we have already answered that question there. The nucleus, the ribosome, transcription, translation. Name the end product of the metabolic activity mentioned in question. This was a giveaway, guys. If the question asks you firstly what process is it, and you said it's protein synthesis, what does that mean? It means to make proteins. So what is going to be the end product when you're making proteins? Obviously, it would be a protein. Mono units from which now they want to say also, they want to say name the, this, this question continues here, right? Name the monomer units from which the complex molecule mentioned in question C1 is formed. Monomer means the building block. What makes a protein? And the diagram already told you that it was amino acids. Name the bond that binds these amino acids, monomers of the final product, and you should know that as being peptide bonds. Right from the left to the right, the correct base sequence of. Okay, now here you needed to be careful because nowhere on this messenger RNA have they given you any codes. You notice? So you needed to infer. First of all, just to recap what's happening during transcription in the nucleus, DNA unwinds, as we can see what's happening there. It's unwinding. So the two strands separate. These strands act as templates. They provide a code which is going to be copied by messenger RNA. This is what is happening during transcription. The process is controlled by enzymes. Now, if this is the messenger RNA that's forming from this template here, that's one, let's call it one, two. Then we've got to look at the letters that are given here. And the letters are, I'm going to put them in threes, A, T, C, A, A, G, T, A, C. Those are the three that we can see, and the last one is C, G. Okay, I'll just put that there. So... If this was the messenger RNA, then that first one there had to be A must become U, T will become A, and C will become G, U, A, G. A combines with U, T combines with A, and C combines with G. The next one would be U, U, C. The next one would be A, U, G. So in other words, our messenger RNA, there's our messenger RNA, is lying here now. It has come out from there, it's lying here. So this would be, the first one would be UAG. The second one would be UUC. The third one would be AUG. This is the homework that you have to do when you're answering this question. Now you can go back to the question. The question says, Write from the left to the right the correct base sequence of codon labeled for. Codon means the code base triplet, rather, where? On the messenger RNA. So we've got to go to the diagram 
label four, and we've already answered that. That's U U C. Uracil, uracil cytosin. Notice we do not use the letter T, thymine, in RNA because RNA does not have thymine. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one says, and here's your answer there. Did they ask for codon there? Let me see. Codon labeled four. Let's go back. Codon level four, right? That was there. ATC AAG UUC UUC is the correct answer there, right? Okay. Then we move on. Then we move on. Anticodon labeled eight. Anticodon label eight. This is an anticodon. Okay. Let's get some color. Anticodon labeled eight. Now, what's an anticodon? An anticodon is the triplet that is formed on the transfer RNA. So in other words, the messenger RNA is providing the code, so it's a codon. And the opposite of that is the anticodon. So they don't want number five, they want number eight, because number eight is coming here to number five. And if number five is A, U, G, uh, then number eight has to be combined with that should be T, but there's no T, so it should be U, A, C. So your answer would be U, A, C there, right? Good, and then we'll move on. How many nitrogenous base units form part of the codon? How many nitrogenous base units form part of the codon? Three. All right, that's straightforward. You know what they're talking about there? Let's, let's go back and explain, sorry. Here's a codon, each codon. Here's one codon, here's another codon, here's another codon. And whenever we're talking about protein synthesis, we talk about base triplets. So therefore, three, codon, uh, three nitrogenous bases will form one codon. Just the same way three nitrogenous bases will form one anticodon. Same thing there. Now, this is where the question takes a twist. Up to there, the questions are basically based on, basically based, they are based on the theory of protein synthesis. Now they want to test the application. You know that adenine combines with thymine or in RNA it will be adenine combines with uracil. Remember we did this at the beginning when we did DNA at cute girl, A with T and C with G. But we said that RNA, no T. So the T is replaced by, let's use another color just for uracil. You have to know this combination to answer the next question. The table shows the base triplets of DNA and amino acid with each, which each code for. With reference to the diagram, in question seven, and the table, well, the question seven, that comes from the original question, and the table diagram below, name the amino acids labeled P, Q, and R, respectively. Now look at the base triplets of DNA. This is the, and here you must be very careful, guys. You have to be very careful. Notice what they're saying here, the base triplets of DNA. They could change that to the base triplets of messenger RNA or they could change that to the base triplets of transfer RNA. So you need to be careful. Here they're talking about DNA. So let's take away that in case you get confused later. All right, okay. So they're telling you these are the base triplets and these are the amino acids that they code for. You do not have to memorize this. If they ask you this question, they have to give you this table. So they want to know P, Q, and R. We go back to our diagram. P, Q, and R. So P came from ATC, right? There's it there. Q came from AAG. And R came from TAC. So obviously then, we need to look at this table, and we look at the answers, and you'll see that whatever the story there, you'll see that P was coded by valine. Ah. 
CAA, let's go back up. ATC, ATC, no, that's wrong. So let's go back, ATC, we go back to our table there. ATC, not even given in this table, so the question is faulty there. Q, Q is this one here, amino acid Q would be UUC, so it came from where? It came from AAG. Let's see if our table has that there. AAG, not even given here as well. AAG is not given here. There's a problem with the question, guys. Sorry about that. So if what, what you have would have to do, you would have to go to the table. If this was, for example, AAG, then whatever it said there, you're going to use that one to give that answer. Okay? Let me just go back to the question to see whether I've got the right thing in the first place. It was ATC, the first one, yes. Good. The second one was AAG, yes, I got that right. And the last one was TAC. And the question does say from DNA, and we have looked at it properly. They don't have those things here because they're talking about the DNA triplet, and those letters that we mentioned are not given there. So in a case like this, if it had to happen in an exam, they would have to give the credit to the learners. Okay? If the table is incorrect, then you won't be able to work it out. But what you need to do, again, it's not the right and the wrong answer. The question is, how do I read it? You look for the DNA code, go on a table, see what amino acid is coding for, and you give the answer accordingly. With that, Megan. Okay, well, we'll just be looking at that table a little bit more in the break. And I have a very special question to ask Aslam. So with that, I'll leave that with you, and we'll see you right after the break. Hello, Mindsetters. Welcome back. Hope you had a great break. Stretch out those muscles and are ready to tackle the rest of our lesson. So I see that we have some questions and Azlam and I were talking about them. So I'm going to ask him some of them from you, Mindsetters. Again, if you want to ask us questions, I'll read them to him in the break or now on TV and then your question could be on live. So don't forget that is facebook.com forward slash learn extra. So Aslam, let me tell you, okay. Noah Emanuel says, what is the difference between DNA replication and transcription by Emanuel? Oh, that's his name. Okay. Noah, no? Yeah. Noah. Okay, Noah. let's take that one first. Noah wants to know, and this was in the Gauteng paper, I think, uh, the difference between replication and, and transcription. Transcription. Good question, Noah. Okay. Now, how do we answer this question? We, nobody's going to teach you, guys. This is transcription, this is the replication, and these are the differences. We teach you replication. We teach you transcription. You know the processes. You must be able to infer the differences. This is higher level thinking and higher, higher level questions. questions. So yeah. we know what's happening during transcription and, and what's happening there. Who, what structure does transcription, first of all? DNA. So replication only takes place in DNA. Transcription involves DNA and messenger RNA. That's the first thing. Replication only takes place in DNA. DNA. Transcription, on the other hand, involves DNA and messenger RNA stealing this code. You can't write that in the exam, stealing the code, eh? <laughs> okay. Imagine. Okay. Replication the resultant strands are identical. In the case of transcription, the messenger RNA strand that is resultant is not identical. We don't write that though, I'm writing it just for your explanation, but it has the complementary that's the first thing. Has the complementary nitrogenous bases. Secondly, the resultant strand is double stranded here. It is made up of two strands. Whereas in transcription is a single strand. If this DNA has all the nitrogenous bases, it would have thymine. The messenger RNA that results from transcription would have uracil. 
Can you see? And you can go on with that there, with what you are saying there in terms of that. You can talk about the enzyme that's involved here is DNA polymerase, and here it is transcriptase. It's not really stressed in the syllabus, the names of the enzymes. So use that as a last option. But these are simple uh, differences. Next okay, question. perfect. Thank you. Now, Owen Talker says, how does mutation occur during protein synthesis? Excellent question. Owen. Yes, Owen Talker. Owen wants to know, how does a mutation take place during protein synthesis? synthesis. Yeah. Now, I'm going to put a question out there. When will it take place? So first of all, we have to understand how many different things happen in protein synthesis. The first thing that happens is DNA replication. That's taking place. We remember when we say that the DNA unwinds. When does the DNA unwind? During replication. So what's happening? The messenger RNA sneaks in. It sneaks in and sneaks out. Replication continues. The DNA carries on with its business. All that has happened is this messenger RNA nucleotides have snuck in. They've formed their bonds according to the coal, and they went out. Why? Because DNA does not leave the nucleus. DNA cannot, does not need leave the nucleus. So messenger RNA takes this message to the cytoplasm. Okay. After that, we're saying that transcription takes place. And then we're saying translation takes place. So the mutation can take place there or there. That during transcription, as the, tr uh, the transcription is taking place, as messenger RNA is copying the code, it may, for some reason, take one wrong nitrogenous base. If that happens, then it's a mutation. What is a mutation? Any change in the DNA sequence, or in the nitrogenous base sequence, or in the DNA, or you can say in the gene. And the gene is from the DNA. So any change in that brings about a mutation. So, or it can also happen during translocation, that the code is read incorrectly, and we're putting the wrong amino acid in the wrong place. So if, for example, the mistake starts there from the DNA, the change happened in the DNA, the DNA then has now coded a wrong code for the transcription to take place. Now, if the messenger RNA is wrong, it's going to give the wrong message there by translation. So the wrong amino acid is going to come in place. Now, it all depends how this mutation takes place. Whether it was just one nitrogenous blaze, say there was supposed to be a T, and it was replaced by a C. So it happened at one point. Everything else remains the same, so that one amino acid would be different. Or if we have what we call an insertion or a deletion, meaning if we had this situation in the DNA, and for some reason we inserted here another A. Now this whole thing changes, T, A, A, C, G, C, C, and it carries on. So can you see that the whole frame has shifted? We call this frame shift mutation. And to illustrate that further, if that was the sentence, the dog ate the cat, and for some reason somebody writes there, dog ate the cow, okay, it's ridiculous for that to happen unless you're watching uh, one of these sci fi movies or one of these uh, heavy science fiction stuff. But what has happened? Everything else remained the same except the last word. But if for some reason we decide to insert a letter somewhere, we put in another E here. Now what happens? Because everything stays in threes in our situation. You're getting some heavy Afrikaans vulgar language coming up. <laughs> Can you read that now? Uh, okay. Definitely not. The Edo mm, uh, uh, S Ika. Yeah, so can you so see what happened with the frame shift? You can't read. <laughs> Everything shifts. But it, they, can e they can be equally harmful. For example, sickle cell anemia is caused by a point mutation. One nitrogenous base changes. 
and it changes one amino acid. But whatever it happens, whatever happens here, the amino acid sequence will change, and therefore the protein that is going to be produced will change, and that protein will have a different structure and a different function. So that's how it is linked to protein synthesis. Okay, and the last question is Wiseman Halongwe says, what is the importance of DNA replication? Wiseman wants to know. Wiseman. He wants to know what is the importance of replication. Oh, that's a wise question, Wiseman. <laughs> okay, what, why does rep DNA replicate? Now you've got to link to meiosis and mitosis. At the end of mitosis and meiosis, what do you realize? That each of the cells that have formed have single-strand chromatids. And when replication takes place, the chromatids make copies of themselves, and therefore they have double-stranded chromosomes. But why is this important? Because we want the daughter cells to have identical DNA as the parent. This is the whole purpose, that the daughter cells that form must have the same DNA. Not only the same in terms of identical, it must also have the same amount of DNA. And why is all this important? Because we want to transfer characteristics, or rather transfer genes first to the offspring. And these genes will give the characteristics. Good? Are we done? Uh, there are a lot of more questions, or do you, you want to go? after. Okay, right. let's carry on. Okay. Mindset is keep posting your questions, because Aslam and I will surely get to them and answer them for you guys. Let's do uh, one more question on uh, DNA, uh, DNA and protein synthesis. This one from the prep paper 2013. One question we can leave out. The three diagrams below represent different processes that occur in the cell. There we have one process A, process B, and process C. Briefly describe process A. What is process A? You can see something is coming there, and it's doing something, and then we have two all of a sudden instead of one. That is obviously a replication. Replication. What do we mean by replication? DNA makes a copy of itself. How does it do this? The strands unwind. The hydrogen, so the words, again, let's, let's remind you about words that we spoke about when we did this section. We speak about unwind, unzip, rezip, rewind, enzymes. Unwind, the DNA molecule unwinds. Secondly, the uh, hydrogen bonds break, so we say that the strands separate. That's what we mean by unzip. Rezip, new nucleotides that are found in the, uh, in the nucleoplasm will combine according to the codes, A with T, C with G, and that is what we mean by rezip. And after the two molecules, each, each of the two separate strands have now a new strand that is attached to it. So they act as templates onto which a new strand is built. And these then will rewind. They'll become double helix again. And all these are controlled by an enzyme. Good? Straightforward. Remember, we only need to know those four words, they're five words. Tabulate the two differences between process A and process B. We have already done that. And obviously, I'm giving you an answer then. Uh, replication, and this would be transcription. Okay, we've done that already. We're not going to go back. Describe the role of molecule X in protein synthesis. Molecule X is obviously messenger RNA. Its role is to copy the code during transcription from the DNA and go out of the nucleus onto the ribosome to provide the code for the assembly of amino acids later. All right? Identify the specific process of protein synthesis occurring at C. Here you can see the, tra uh, the transfer RNA is coming and what's happening there. That's obviously then translation. Good. Give the number of the structure that represents the following. Ribosome and transfer RNA molecule. Ribosome is in this area here. Uh, it's number one, actually. It's not clear on the screen. And what's the other one? A transfer RNA molecule. It'll be number four. 
Number four would be the transfer RNA molecule. Good. What is a codon for the amino acid number three? Similar question, but now put differently. Amino acid number three, and if we look at the letters that are put there, the codon is the one that's on the uh, messenger RNA, and that is GGC. So that would be your answer there. And anticodon for the amino acid that occurs after three. After three. So you should have to be careful what you are saying there. So the anticodon one after three will be this one. It's AUG is the codon. So if AUG is the codon, it will be UAC, the anticodon for that one. That would cover us on DNA replication and uh, protein synthesis. The diagram below represents a process taking place during meiosis. I give you a diagram there, a process, label parts A, B, C, D. Let's do that on the diagram. A, notice it's showing you this as a curly bracket there, so that is a chromosome. It's not showing you both, only one. You can't say homologous chromosome. A B is this one here. Let's just write it there. B is this little quirky in the middle there. That is the centromere. C, showing you one strand only, so that becomes the chromatid. And D is the point where the chromatids cross over, so that is known as a chiasma. Because it's one, we say chiasma. If there's more than one, it becomes chiasmata. All right, so we've done that. Name the process in meiosis that is illustrated there. Obvious. And that would be crossing over. State one, importance of the process. This answer will never change. Crossing over allows for the exchange of genetic material. Because from here it's going to go there, from there it's going to come here. And this brings about variation. Mixing of genetic material or shuffling of genetic material, exchange of genetic material, which brings about variation. During which... I'm going to take this out because that is from an older paper, from the other version. We're going to say of which stage. We do not have to know the names of the phase. Of during which stage of meiosis does the process mentioned above occur? That means stage one or stage two. And our answer would be stage one. If you want to know the phase, it's prophase one. Remember, for exam purposes, you do not need to know the name of the phase. Phase, but you need to know that meiosis has stage one, stage two. More about that after the break. Thank you, Mr. Aslam. Guys, don't stress, don't go anywhere because right after the break, we'll be back with prelim exam revision. Welcome back, mindsetters. Can you believe it? Prelim exam revision. I can't believe this. We are doing it. So I want to tell you, let me not stress to you, if you have questions, so let's say you have questions on you from Mpumalanga and you have questions on paper two because paper two is next week. Am I right? Hmm. Wednesday yeah. and Saturday. Okay, perfect. So next week's paper two, send your questions through to help desk. And I told you I've posted the link. It is help, help, uh, <laughs> learnextra.co.za forward slash help desk. It's also available on Mixit. So I'm sure that you can download it or click and buy it. So I just want to tell you that we have a few seconds left and I want you to keep posting your questions because we have a lot of questions, but even if we don't get through to those questions, you know that you can forward them onto the help desk. And don't go anywhere because after this we have math, literacy, accounting and geography. So please, mindsetters, stay with me. Peace. Good. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> uh, study this diagram below and answer the questions based on it. Why would you be able to classify this particular karyotype of being of a human? Now, remember that's a karyotype diagram. It is a human because of the presence of the 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. Remember, chromosome number is specific to specific species. Right? So, because there are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, it would be human, or you can say there are, there are 46 chromosomes in the diagram, or, right, that's all you can say there. Is this 
karyotype of a male or a female. To do that, as I've taught you before, you go to the last pair, pair number 23, and you look at them. Notice they're not going to tell you it's X and Y or X and X. You've got to look at the size of the chromosomes. Are they the same size? Then it's XX. If one is big and one is small, then it's XY. In this case, it's XX, so therefore the karyotype has to be that of a female. Give a reason for your answer. I gave you the reason already. There are two chromosomes of the same size at chromosome number 23. Draw a detailed diagram, a sketch of one of the chromosomes of the homologous pair. Uh, straightforward, just to draw a chromosome there. Uh, we're talking about, oops, let me rather draw that for you. It'll look nicer, I think. Drawing a chromosome, you're just going to draw two lines. And, oops. What is happening? All right, and something like that. You're going to label it as a diagram showing a chromosome, two chromatids, and a centromere, just to show a chromosome. That is all they needed to see there. Good. Uh, this one here was Gauteng Department of Education essay. L let's look at this and analyze it very quickly. Organisms display two distinct types of cell division which result in the formation of new cells. Discuss, here's the verb, what must you discuss? The differences between the two types of cell division by describing how they occur and also state the difference in the significance of each type. We wouldn't have time to answer the essay, but just to show you how easy this essay was. First of all, how many types of cell division have you learned in your life? Only two mitosis and meiosis. So that's what we are talking about. You had to mention that we are talking about mitosis and meiosis. So the first part tells you to discuss the differences between them. And it did not expect you to go the whole process, although the question said by describing how they occur. It simply means you must isolate the differences and you explain those differences because the differences are telling you how they occur. Talk about where, how they occur, crossing over, no crossing over, etc. chromosomes moving apart, chromatids moving apart, and lastly, the significance of these differences. The next question, the graph below show, represents the global distribution of genetically modified crops. A little bit of genetics, study the graph and answer the questions. Which is the leading country that is actively engaged in the production of genetically modified foods? You can see from there, far above the rest would be the United States of America. What is the general trend observed in the production of genetically modified crops in these, those countries? They are increasing. They're showing an increasing trend. All of them, from there to there, increase, 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 increase. All the countries are showing an increase. What is the percentage increase in land utilization for the purpose of planting genetically modified crops in Brazil? You have to look at the graph and you have to then say the story there in terms of the calculation, simple. You're going to work it out, 25 minus 21 equals 4. 4 over 25 times 100 equals 16 percent. Straightforward. Recent studies show that herbicide use has increased with genetically modified uh, herbicide, uh, herbicide tolerant crops. Disproving claims by biotech pronouns that genetically modified crops reduce. Her Remember, those that want to sell you the idea of genetically modified uh, crops. They say the reason, the arguments for, is that it reduces the use of herbicides. But these guys are saying that it is increased. Mention anyone disadvantaged with regard to the use of herbicide-resistant genetically modified crops. And that would be the emergence of superweeds. That means, superweeds means weeds or pests that have become resistant to the pesticide, and that causes a problem, and environmental pollution. The herbicide doesn't only harm the plant that it is used for, it may harm the soil and other plants in that area, so that's another problem there. Draw a pie chart illustrating the land utilization there, okay? That's straightforward again. You must do your calculation first, and how do you do your calculations? The percentage or the, the land usage over that 
times 360. Why 360? Because 360 makes a circle, and that's what your pie chart is about, a circle, and you're converting it to angles, so you show all your calculations there, and thereafter you draw the pie chart. When you draw your pie chart, make sure you have a heading, there's a mark given for that. You use a pie chart, so you're getting another mark for that. Your slices are correct, you may get another mark from that. And you must show the keys that are linked to that as well. Uh, this story here says, study the family trees in the figure below, which shows the occurrence of hemophiliacs in a certain family, and that's where we're going to cut it, after surveys were carried out. Here's Albert, he was hemophiliac your homework that you have to do. Remember, because hemophilia is a sex-linked disease, Albert is a boy, so you're going to use X, ah, Aslam, X, Y. Beatrice is a female, X, X. Uh, Carol is a female. Normally, they should tell you that because, you know, we could give, give people different names for different sexes, but this is what I'm telling you, X, Y, and X, X. So anytime you get a diagram that deals with sex link. You first put your XX and your XY so you don't forget that this question requires that. Because Albert is hemophiliac and hemophilia is caused by a recessive gene, we put a small letter H there. We do not put anything on the Y because the Y can't take anything there. Normal but carrier, so she has a capital H, normal, but she's carrying it. Normal, carrier, again. And here Eckert hemophiliac and Carol hemophiliac double small h there. Can you see the type of uh, answer that you're going to get already? Without working this out, you've already got the genotypes of all your organisms. Whenever you get this type of a chart or a pedigree and it's sex link, you do that. Guys, I'm going to have to stop there. First of all, name pattern of inheritance given is a sex link inheritance because it is showing that it's carried on the sex chromosome. Now, remember your exams proper. Some of you right next week, you're doing CAT practicals, but the proper exam starts around the 28th of uh, October. Whatever your first paper is, it doesn't mean that from today till the 27th of October you must study only for that particular paper. You have to pace yourself out. You've got to have a timetable. Give so many hours per day, so many subjects per day, and over time you prepare for the entire exam. When you come to the exam, you must just be revising day for day for the next paper. I wish you well for all of that, and as Megan is talking to you, she's <laughs> going to leave you with a better message. A better message? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Thank you so much for the lesson. Thank you, Mindsetters. The interaction was great. Don't forget, help desk to answer all the questions we didn't get to answer. Thank you so much for tuning in to Prelim Exam Revision. Don't, don't go anywhere because right after this is math, literacy, accounting, and geography. I stress you not. Thank you, Mindsetters. It's been a great, great show. I'll see you again after this. Cheers, guys.